And that's another reason why the psychological testing is an important piece to add to it, because it has built into it this, you know, BS detector um, that mm-hmm. we don't have in the real world. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> we I don't love that. Really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. and Welcome to Donor Conception Conversations. This is a one podcast created exclusively for people who are planning to use donor conception to build a family or have already used donor conception to build a family. I'm your host, Lisa Schumann. As a researcher, an author, and a therapist, and an expert in donor conception, I'm passionate about helping people on their donor conception journey. I've worked for fertility clinics around the world and have helped so many people with their donor conception journey. I've run workshops for donor-conceived children and met thousands and thousands of recipients and donors. Through my experience and the experience of my guests, I will share the tools and the truths that you need to have a better path to parenthood and tackle all of those challenging parenting issues. And today, I have a wonderful, wonderful guest who I've been so excited to get on the show because you will be so thrilled to, to meet him. His name is John Kurtz, and I will tell you a little bit about him, and he will tell you a little bit more about himself. But first, um, let me give you a little background. He's a psychologist, licensed psychologist at Villanova University. He's also the author of several publications, including peer-reviewed studies in psychological testing, and is a specialist in a test called the Personality Assessment Inventory, which we're going to be talking about. And this is the most widely used and respected psychological test in our field. I speak about this test often, and John helped to create this test. He is really an icon in our field. He, He does such wonderful work, not just as a professor, but also in helping us all realize how important this test is. I think that many of our audience understand that there's been a lot in the news about uh, psychological difficulties with donor-conceived children, problems with donors, and he is helping to kind of change this world by helping people understand this test, helping professionals like me understand the test and do a better job, and also helping to educate organizations about why they need to use this test. And he's going to teach you a little bit today. And so even though this may seem like a little bit of a dry topic, I think it's the absolute most exciting topic that we could be talking about. So uh, without further ado, I introduce you to John Kurtz. He's a wonderful person as well. And John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, and I appreciate that excessively generous introduction. I have been interested in assessment since before I went to graduate school. Um, and I was really fortunate that when I was a graduate, when I went to Vanderbilt to go get my PhD, Les Morey, who's the author of the personality assessment inventory, was just starting really in the initial stages of writing the items and, and doing the uh, initial selections. Um, so I've been involved with the PAI since uh, before it was published. And um, it's been excited to see how much it has grown and how much research has accumulated on it over the decades. Now, how did I get into reproductive medicine? I didn't know yeah. anything about the world that you know you've been working in for decades um, until 2008. Um, and I think it was around that time, Lisa, you would know better than I, that there was a new standard um, from the American Society mm-hmm. for Reproductive Medicine that evaluating gamete donors should include what they called objective psychological testing. So I think that sort of caused a bit of a mad scramble for people to find out, you know, what tests to use, how do you use it, how do you uh, make decisions about um, gamete donors and and gestational carriers and all this. Um, so they eventually found their way to me, I think through Les. I think originally uh, people reached out to Les Morey and then, you know, he referred uh, on to me. And uh, so I've been in, ever since then getting to know people like Lisa and all the other really nice people who are in the mental health professionals group. Um, mostly I help clinicians. So a disclaimer, I don't uh, see the intended parents who are trying to build families. Mm-hmm. I actually don't really ever see the donor candidates either. My work mostly involves working with the mental health professionals who are using the test 
to help them understand how to best employ all the scores and indexes and combination to make the right decisions and to communicate the the findings in a, in a report to the agencies and intended parents. Well, that's fantastic. And um, just for you know our viewers, it's so important to understand the value of this test. So I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit of, about the way that it's used. Um, I think that many people read the article in the Wall Street Journal about the young man, unfortunately, who committed suicide because he was schizophrenic. It turned out his sperm donor was schizophrenic. There's been a lot of difficulties there. And while people really want to find a donor that they're comfortable with and they like and they feel, you know, reminds them of their best friend, in reality, apart from the genetic contribution, we also want to know are there psychological predispositions that will either prevent somebody from donating for a number of reasons, because it's not right for them, or that there's some other mental health issue that would prevent uh, us from wanting them to to use their genetics. So um, could you talk a little bit about that and how we can hope to do our best job possible to prevent this transmission of um, inherited psychological problems mm-hmm. by uh, using this this test. I, I couldn't put it much better than you just did. I mean, it really mm-hmm. uh, the importance of testing is really to protect all parties involved. Um, so everybody has got a stake in this. Um, there's a family who wants to have children. Um, and there are people who, for various reasons, want to uh, donate eggs or sperm. And sometimes uh, those people have have problems. And, and the, certainly the testing results come back. And that evaluation situation has provided someone with an opportunity to let people know that they're in distress or they're suffering Sometimes it's often looked at too much as something that's trying to protect, trying to screen out bad genes or things like that. But it's it's also about whether that's the right per, right thing for that person to be doing at this point in their life. So, in other words, we could be in a, there could be a situation where a donor may have, let's say, it's a and you know an example of a known donor, and maybe you know, someone really wants to donate to their sibling and they really feel like this would be a nice thing to do, but maybe they're, you know, on some level too anxious to do it or really don't want to do it or feel kind of persuaded in a way that's not going to be healthy for the relationship. That may be something that we can see in the PAI. For sure. Um, And I'm glad you brought up that really good example of when it's a family donor, when it's a known donor situation, that can be really tricky. You know, somebody doesn't want to tell her sister that she, you know, doesn't feel comfortable with doing this. Maybe not just her sister, but the whole family, you know, can be invested in it and she doesn't want to be the one to. And so sometimes those people, they'll get test results that don't look very good. and that could be yeah, not necessarily saying they're lying, but it uh, they're able to reveal things in the testing that that were more difficult to disclose in conversation or face to face with the family. Yeah. So, and and the way that the test would work, because I get this question a lot, is not ask actually asking that direct question. Would you like to donate to your sister? But but it asks a number of questions that, that once you put them all together, it paints this picture of anxiety around it or difficulty in their life or some other reason why um, that person may not be the best candidate, right? Correct. So the yeah. PAI and other tests like it that are used, we, we often call them omnibus personality inventories. So it, they cover a lot of territory, which is why they have so many questions. I think probably one of the complaints you might get is why are there so many questions? Um, because mm-hmm. the PAI covers both like internalizing problems such as depression, anxiety. Um, it also asks about a number of bodily medical somatic complaints too, which can be very relevant for you know people who are going to be undergoing 
you know, hormone treatments and so forth to know mm-hmm. that, that they have some sensitivities in that domain. Um, but then also externalizing things. So people are sort of risk-taking uh, people who um, have substance abuse problems, people who have difficulties following rules, people who have problems with anger and impulse control and things like that. So that more of that, what we call the externalizing spectrum of disorders. And then in between, you've got the thinking problems. So just those are three broad areas, but the PAI has uh, covers 22 different full domains of psychopathology. So in one test that people can take in about 45 to 60 minutes, it can give you a, a fairly broad view of their mental health status. That's fantastic. That's amazing. That must have been very difficult to create. Yes, it was, you know, (laughs) although when I look back on it, it was developed in about, but probably under three years, but that was, it was a big project. Every Friday afternoon, long meetings. (laughs) I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, we're very grateful for it because it's, it really helps so many people. And as you're seeing I think you're seeing, John, you can tell us more that more and more people are using it, more and more sperm banks and egg donor banks and groups are really under, starting to understand the value of using that along with the psychological interview in order to really help screen donors. Absolutely. So the testing, I often mm-hmm. tell people, complements the interview. So sometimes the interview finds things that the person didn't reveal in testing and vice versa. Sometimes people will admit things to the test that they couldn't say to the interviewer. Um, and every time that happens, sometimes it's a little inter- uh, it's a little um, annoying to the mental health professional that the two don't line up, but then I'm always quick to remind them that's why you do both because um, exactly. if they always gave you the same information, you wouldn't need to do, you could just do one or the other. Um, I should also point out that the PAI isn't the only one. I get my sense aligns with yours that it's used the most often in the reproductive medicine field, but it's not the only instrument that could be used. There's another one called the MMPI-2, mm-hmm. which has been around for a while, um, and it's that's used all over the place. It's really, so a question you might get is why the MMPI or the PAI, they really work quite similarly. Um, especially the MMPI-2 has been uh, updated very recently, just in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Now there's the MMPI-3, which is a great improvement over the MMPI-2. And actually the MMPI-3, I would say, is more similar. The PAI and MMPI-3 are more similar, certainly in length, in their construction strategy. So if someone out there is hearing that an MMPI was used, uh, not a PAI, that isn't necessarily like some fault or problem. It's it's the same thing. Okay. Well, I think that's good for people to know and mm-hmm. also to know that those tests are are very valuable and similar. Whereas, you know, in the past I've seen people say, well, you know, my donor took a personality profile test. And that's really not worth a hell of beans, unfortunately. Um, right? It's not gonna, you know, help knowing, you know, if you have, you know, a, a cheery or outgoing personality or you're afraid of public speaking, that's not quite as important. So these are these are the tests that John's mentioning that are really, really important. And um, we really need to make sure that your donor has this sort of test. In terms of construction, John, I just kind of want to go back to you for a second. You know, you you mentioned different difficulties that people could be struggling with. And I, I just wanted to kind of highlight that because sometimes in the psychological interview, there are things you wouldn't know. For for example, bipolar disorder, right? You could know you could even have someone in, in therapy for six months and maybe they didn't have a manic cycle in that six months. And so you wouldn't know. Right. Sure. And so, but those things might be revealed in the PAI, right? There may be a leaning towards manic behavior, experiencing manic behavior. And I've even seen some patients who come to me as known donors and they say, well, you know, now I understand why I had this difficulty or that difficulty. They didn't even really understand that they had some struggles with some difficulties. So they're the PAI or the MMPI two or three can get at difficulties that maybe people don't even know about themselves, right? Correct. And actually your your example of bipolar really intersects well with, you know, 
the gamete donation because somebody who is experiencing, you know, the manic phase of a bipolar disorder might think, oh my goodness, my genes really need to get out into the world. And they, you know, so that is just the kind of thing that can lead a person to that situation of being evaluated to be a, a gamete donor. And another thing that I would like to circle back to as well, that you were talking about personality and I think I should clarify that personality is in the title of the PAI and um, the MMPI, but what we're really looking for for screening gamete donors is psychopathology. So we don't actually, it it doesn't matter so much what their natural personality is like, whether they're a warm extrovert or something like that. We're really looking for more major forms of psychopathology. Um, But I, I think in clinical assessment, we tend to, Put that all under the umbrella term of personality because there's a there's a fine line between personality differences and then psychopathological syndromes, but it's really more the latter that's a concern. I think for uh, screening donors, we wouldn't want to suggest that only people with certain kinds of personality can certain kinds of natural personality differences. You know, people are widely different, and they should yes. offer an opportunity to to be involved in the process if they're healthy. That's a very good point. And, you know, I certainly know my family, me and my siblings all have very different personalities, but we came from the same family, right? So, Isn't that amazing? Um, <laughs> yes, it's amazing how that happens, right? So just because you like your donor's personality doesn't mean that's what you're getting, but you may have a predisposition for some psychopathology if your donor has that. And that's something that, you know, you do have some control over. There's so, you know, so many things we don't have control over in life or in this process. But if we have an opportunity to use this test to help us gain more information, we should absolutely, absolutely use it. Um, also, I, I was wondering, John, about this, um, the deception piece of the P- PAI. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think people would be interested to know about that as well. That is a very important issue. So the PAI and the MMPI are one particular strategy of personality assessment. And what we've got, it's called structured testing. So questionnaires are, you know, a set list of questions that people can read. And then they have a finite set of answers. You know, they they might be able to go on, write a page long essay in response to one of those questions, but instead they have to say true or false if it's the MMPI, or they get four options if it's the PAI, you know, false and then three gradations of true. That brings about a lot of advantages in personality assessment. Mainly it's a lot less work. Uh, You can have computers score the test for you. Um, They've traditionally been called objective tests, but it's only objective in the sense that the person who gives the test, the mental health professional, doesn't have to judge the results. The results have a key. It's automatically scored. It can be scored by a computer. So questionnaires tend to be favored for their great convenience, but they have one big drawback. So a questionnaire is transparent and a person can read the questions and they can decide to answer in any way they choose. And we can can often be concerned, like you're saying, with deception. It, and that, I think, can be obvious, too, to the people who want to donate and maybe to the people who are needing the valid results of the test, the intended parents. It's like, well, why? how do I know that this person isn't just lying to the on the test? Yeah. So I have two things to say to that. First thing, the test also has scales and procedures that are built in that evaluate the credibility of both individual item answers as well as the overall credibility of the configuration of scores that a person produces. I hope that doesn't sound too technical. In other words, Mm -hmm. looking at the big picture results, also we can match it to more or less probable outcomes of the whole test profile. But then the other thing I would say too is Test results can be inaccurate or what we call distorted by both intentional or effortful means on the part of the respondent, but they also can happen through innocent, unconscious, unintended uh, reasons as well. So a donor might sit down to take the PAI and be perfectly cooperative 
and they intend to be honest on the test. And let's say hypothetically that they're they're healthy, that they don't really have any major forms of psychopathology, but they still might answer the test in a very distorted way that gives an unrealistically positive picture. But they might, you know, in their state of mind, they were being honest, but they were answering the test thinking about, well, what's the right way to answer this? And what's the right way to answer this? And they don't necessarily think that that's inaccurate to describe them, but they get sort of, as I put it, they get the reactive to the demands of the situation. So they perceive the situation of meeting with you or meeting with another mental health professional as I'm supposed to be a good person. I'm supposed to be a healthy person. So this is a test of whether that's true of me. And so I better give all the right answers on it. Like they're on a job interview. Correct. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's absolutely a, a longstanding issue in personnel selection is, you know, people wanting to look good. But there's another distinctively different situation where a person sits down to take the test and they have problems. You know, maybe they were hospitalized six months ago psychiatrically, and but they really want to donate their eggs or sperm. And so they want to conceal it from you. So that I reserve the word deception for when a person knows that the results they're giving you are wrong and that, that they know there's something important that you'd like to know. And when they encounter questions about depression or suicidal ideation, they say false, but they know that that's not the right answer for them. Again, getting back to this idea that in when we're evaluating donor candidates, the real nature of their personality isn't as important as are they hiding something or do they not need to hide anything? Are they, you know, an, a normal, healthy person? And so there are actually even some procedures built into the PAI to tell whether it's that kind of innocent defensiveness that's actually in research. We found that that's associated in general with healthy uh, personalities. So people who are very healthy can sometimes show a very strong version of that unconscious, innocent defensiveness. But what we really want to find are people who know better, people who know that what they're telling you is not true. People are concealing something from you. And that's what I call those people, effortful, deceptive respondents. Right. And then I think when we see that, we have two problems. One is we don't know the real results of the PAI, right? Because there are, we can't really take what they're saying is valid. But secondly, it extends to everything else. We don't know if they're telling the truth about their medical information to the clinic. We don't know if they're telling the truth to the when they write something about their narrative to the sperm bank, right? So um, it puts puts the donor in a whole different category because we just all of a sudden now we just don't know who that person is, right? And that's another reason why the psychological testing is an important piece to add to it, because it has built into it this, you know, BS detector um, that mm -hmm. we don't have in the real world. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> we I don't love that. Yeah. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. So if people are filling out a health checklist or or they're answering your interview questions, mm -hmm. there's no validity scale there. There are no uh, procedures. But with the PAI and the MMPI, there, there's so many questions asked that they can be combined and recombined in different ways, and we can do research with it. Um, so that's really the great advantage of of structured tests like questionnaires is they've been taken by thousands of people. So we know what to expect and we can also do research with it. So we can evaluate different experimental conditions. We can look at um, how people answer from different kinds of diagnostic groups. We can see what life outcomes it predicts. So because everybody answers the same questions in the same order with the same response format, we can know a lot more about the next person who sits down to take the test because we know so much about thousands of people who went before them and answered the same test. Mm -hmm. So that, that is yeah. really the power of psychological testing. But of course, a clinical interview from a skilled uh, mental health professional like mm -hmm. you, Lisa, that's also a very powerful thing. And so I, I always emphasize that the two can work together as long as they listen to each other, as long as one doesn't, you know, veto the other. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, John. And I really value uh, your, you know, all this work that you've done and this PAI because it, it does give us so much, you know, valuable information about, as we discussed, deception and psychopathology. And then another thing is informed consent because, 
you know, if you have a situation, you know, I've seen situations where maybe there's a known donor and you think, you know, your neighbor or your friend or your cousin is the perfect person to donate. And then you discover something about that person through this testing. Then that person, then the person, the recipient can say, now knowing that, do I want to go through it with this person or not? Um, whereas before they just thought all these wonderful rosy things about them, at least now they're really considering their future child's genetic predisposition because now they have more information that maybe they didn't have before. That is a tricky situation. That's why your job is so difficult. See, with me as a mm-hmm. researcher, uh, you know, the informed consent we have is you're anonymous, this is confidential, and it's, you know, that test protocol is going to get thrown in a pile with 400 others and we're going to do research on it. So if we if discover a single case in there that's got elevated suicidal ideation, there's nothing we can do about it. But you, uh, at working with the individual case as a clinician, are are in the difficult position of, you know, what do certain parties have the right to know? And I imagine that has to be carefully sorted out in advance to avoid the kind of uncomfortable yeah. situation you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's and it's important for the patient or the donor to know, you know, what we've discovered, certainly, but it really helps us so much because in our work, we really care so much about everyone involved, right? And we have to also think about the future child who isn't born yet and what they're going to be, what they're going to inherit. And the more tools we have to try to help people both, you know, form these good relationships because, you know, there's lots of nice relationships that come from known donor situations, even though some don't. There are some that are really wonderful. And also in situations where people have had the experience of not having met, but have used donor conception and have a beautiful family. So we really just want to protect everyone involved. And I think all these things that you're sharing with us today, John, are so valuable for people to know because this is something that that they can access. And how can the people who are listening find out if their sperm bank, their agency, their clinic, you know, whomever is is the next, the third party in coordinating all of this, if they're using the PAI or the MMPI two or three? That's a great question. Oh. Uh Gosh, how, who do they, who should you, you should ask the question. So you should, you know, ask the question, to find the person who can give you the authoritative yeah. response. But I, you know, it's, I know, I, I understand that the people involved in evaluations can have a lot of ambivalent feelings about testing. I know I've experienced it up close where the testing results come out poorly and everybody was all excited to go forward. And so sometimes uh, doing the testing can feel like, you know, you're the messenger who gets shot. I would yeah. just underscore everything you just said that it's really an important piece of information that complements all the other information that's gathered in the process. And it's an, an important piece um, that shouldn't be ignored or, and certainly shouldn't be skipped. Yes. And I think to, you know, just to highlight what you're saying, John, it's, it's so true that everybody wants this to happen, right? Everybody, no, everybody's, you know, on the same team. We all want to have, you know, you to build a healthy family. But sometimes in haste, you know, everybody's trying to get this to happen, your agency, your clinic, your egg bank or sperm bank, everybody wants this to happen. And then if something goes wrong, of course, it's upsetting. Of course, it's disappointing. But in the long term, you can save yourself and your future child from so many potential problems by stepping back, taking a breath, asking this question about the right type of psychological screening and making sure that that's part of how your donor is assessed. And certainly even in the case of an unknown donor too. I think that's that's so great, John. Well, thank you so much for all this information. I I think it's, um, I I know for a lot of people, it might sound like a dry subject, but I think it's absolutely the most exciting subject that we have. And you might be familiar with the the push to to, um, enact legislation that would, would force 
fertility clinics to do extensive background screening on donors. And unfortunately, I don't think that that's ever going to happen. I don't think the clinics have the wherewithal or the time or the stamina or the money to do that. And also, as we know, you know, you have to be convicted of a crime to have a record, right? So you could be, you know, a serial killer. And if you haven't been caught, it doesn't matter, right? You're never going to know. So until we have a better, you know, mousetrap, this is it. This is really, I think, the way that we're going to be able to, you know, do the best job we can to screen donors and to put everybody in the best place possible. So I'm so grateful for your work, John, and for your continued involvement and your continued help to help me uh, help my patients because I really um, love working with you and all over the years value all the things that you've taught me. So thank you so much. And thank you for coming on this podcast. And I know there's been some technical difficulties. So thanks for hanging in there. (laughs) Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I appreciate you too and your really good, important work you do to help families. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, John. And for all of you out there, um, I'd love you to to uh, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. John, is there any place that people might reach out to you if they have any questions or to any organization in particular, would you recommend? I'm a professor at Villanova University. And so very easy to find. You can just type my name in Villanova in your Google search and you'll find me immediately. You can even type my name in psychology and you'll I come up first. If you just type my name, you'll get uh, a hockey player and uh, or the guy who draws Winnie the Pooh. So um, just <laughs> That's add, great. add Villanova or psychology to it. It's john.kurtz at Villanova EDU if you want to remember that email. And thank you. Terrific. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Really, really appreciate your time and sitting through this. It's a, It may seem a little bit dense, but so worthwhile to get through because this is your future and you know we're here to help you have a better journey so thanks for joining us please subscribe because that's how we uh, keep going and that way you'll make sure that you'll you'll get updated with all of the new um, content that we have and all the new episodes and have a wonderful day we'll see you next time emanating all these people so there are a lot of dangers of finding um, somebody on the internet and just using them without doing your due diligence. And that doesn't even start to get into the legal ramifications of using somebody and whether or not they would be liable for child support or have parental rights.